I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability, as well as its robust interior, are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. Really honored to be joined by probably the best biographer ever, Walter Isaacson. Maybe you've read his stuff or heard about his stuff. He wrote the classic biography of Steve Jobs. He did hundreds of interviews with Jobs and everyone Jobs knew. The best biography I've read of Albert Einstein, Leonardo da Vinci, Benjamin Franklin, and so many other books. He was also the CEO of CNN, and we talk about that a little bit. But this podcast is about his latest book, The Code Breaker, and it's a biography of Jennifer Doudna, gene editing and the future of the human race. She just won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for her work on editing genes. This is the one area of science right now and innovation that I think is going to change all of life, all of society, the entire medical industry, the way we think about disease, the way we think about longevity, the way we think about, I mean, you could even edit genes eventually to change your intelligence, your height, and, and all the ethical issues around that. So without further ado, let's talk to Walter Isaacson. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, no, thank you for writing such a great book. The Code Breaker, not only is it such an illuminating portrayal of Jennifer Doudna, she won the 2020 Nobel Prize in um, chemistry for her work on gene editing and gene editing technology. But as you have done with many of your books, particularly Steve Jobs, Albert Einstein, Da Vinci, with many of your biographies, you seem to say, okay, a revolution has happened or is happening, whether it's technology or physics or the Renaissance, but you focus on the fact that revolutions are driven first by people who are insanely curious and talented and drive this incredible revolutions in technology and society forward. So maybe we could start off with, and by the way, The Code Breaker, which is about Jennifer Doudna, an amazing book, which for me helps me to understand not only about her and her success, but also it's always confusing to understand the relationship between DNA, RNA, how it helps with vaccines like for coronavirus, how gene editing, the, the enormous ethical implications, if we could change our descendants, you know, intelligence, height, uh, you know, susceptibility to diseases. 
You really explained everything so well. I, I encourage people to, to read this and maybe you could help us understand some more of it right now. Well, thank you. Thanks a whole lot, James, for having me on. And yeah, I, I'm interested in revolutions and there've been three great innovation revolutions in our time. And they all stem from the discovery of fundamental kernels of our existence, the atom, the gene, and the bet. And so the first one really is the revolution in physics that comes out of Einstein's 1905 papers and of course the discovery of the atom. And from that we have the atom bomb and space travel and GPS and semiconductors. The next is a revolution that begins in the 1950s, the second half of the 20th century. And that's the discovery that all information can be encoded in binary digits, i.e. bits. And so with the internet, the microchip, and the computer, you end up with a digital revolution. I think we're entering a third great innovation revolution of our time, and that's the biotech revolution. It comes from the discovery of the gene and the discovery that DNA encodes our gene and that RNA is a molecule that actually does a lot of the work. It takes that code and it builds proteins. And that's how these new mRNA vaccines work. And that's how CRISPR works. First off, at a 30,000 foot level, I have tried to tell people that this genomics revolution, this gene editing re revolution could put the whole computer and internet revolution to shame. Like this is going to be so enormous. I mean, potentially every disease could get cured. Every you know, it, we can't even understand all the implications yet because it's starting off small, but it's growing exponentially. When do you think we start to see revolutionary changes that are like, we go, blow our minds from this revolution? We've already had two great uh, revolutionary changes coming out of CRISPR and the genetics revolution. One was a couple of years ago when the Chinese scientist, sort of a rogue scientist, but who had been to Jennifer Doudna's conferences used CRISPR and the CRISPR tool that Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier and others invented in order to edit twin baby girls while they were embryos and create genetic edits in them that cause them not to have the receptor for HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. And that meant that these designer babies, not only would that be part of their genetic makeup, but all of their descendants. So in other words, we could edit the human race. Now, everybody was shocked and somewhat dismayed when that happened. But after coronavirus, this notion of maybe editing our species so we're less susceptible to viruses, that might be a little bit more appealing and a little bit less appalling. We have to think that through. And then the other thing that happened was RNA uh, was used as a tool in order to instruct our cells to build proteins that would become what are known as antigens that would stimulate our immune system so we could fight off a disease. And that disease, of course, was COVID. So whether it's a Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine, it uses RNA as a tool to vaccinate us. And I've already had my Pfizer shot and I was part of the clinical trial early on last July for the Pfizer shot uh, because I'm interested in RNA and the miracles it can perform. And again, people don't realize what, and, or maybe they do, but this is such a huge innovation. Like previously a vaccine would be formed by taking a dead version of a virus and injecting it into you so that your body recognizes it and forms antibodies for it. But now this, due to Jennifer Doudna's research, according to what you say in the book, what the RNA does when it's injected in is it literally changes the programming of these cells that are most susceptible to get the virus, if I'm understanding this correctly. Yeah, what RNA does in what's called the central dogma of biology is that RNA takes the instruction set that's in our DNA, in our genes, and the DNA just sits there in the nucleus. It's kind of the famous sibling, but like a lot of famous siblings, it doesn't do much work. It sits there in the nucleus of our cell just curating information, whereas the RNA goes out to the manufacturing region of the cell and does real work. It actually builds proteins. It makes a real product. 
Now, it, the messenger RNA uh, can make any protein it's been uh, decided it's encoded to make. So we can have it make a protein that mimics the spike protein in a coronavirus. And then when our body sees that fake spike protein, it develops antibodies, it develops an immunity to that spike protein, which is why when I got the Pfizer exam, my body does that. And now if I get uh, exposed to coronavirus, my immune system is ready to do it. What Jennifer Doudna and others also did, and this is how she won the Nobel Prize, is said we can make that into a tool in which a guide RNA, a small snippet of RNA that knows where to go in somebody's genome, can be connected to what we would call an enzyme, which is really just a scissors, a molecular scissors that can cut up a molecule. And it will go right to that part of the DNA that you want to cut. For example, if you uh, want a different hair color, it'll cut the gene for hair color. If you want to be taller, it'll uh, edit your genes to make you taller or stronger. These are things we can't do yet, but we can do simple genetic changes, like the gene that causes sickle cell anemia, a simple genetic mutation. That can be fixed and has been fixed this past year in humans using CRISPR technology. And so has somebody, is it, has somebody, and you give an example in the book, but maybe talk, walk us through someone alive who's been cured of sickle cell anemia using this technology. Yeah, the very first one is a woman named Victoria Gray from rural Mississippi, African-American, because sickle cell anemia tends to affect uh, African-Americans and Africans. She went to a hospital in Memphis. She's been treated for many, many years. She's got a few kids. But this past year, 2020, instead of just giving her new blood transfusions and other things that could help her survive sickle cell anemia, they took out the stem cells of her blood, edited them using CRISPR technology, fixed the genetic mutation that causes sickle cell, and she is now basically cured of sickle cell. There's about seven or eight diseases that are single gene mutations or simple genetic problems. Uh, cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs disease, uh, sickle cell, Huntington's disease. And so over the next five years, I suspect a lot of those will be able to fix. So what happens when, when the edited um, RNA or in the edited genes are injected back into the body, they know where to go. And I mean, sometimes they have to change millions of cells. Like how do they, how does that work? Just, and again, at a high level of view. If it's a blood cell, like in sickle cell anemia or the other blood diseases, you know, you have stem cells that make blood cells all the time. And so it just starts creating healthy blood cells. They're also using it to fix a form of blindness. And the cells in our eyes don't replenish themselves much. So you get them edited and it helps fix the disease. More interesting and more controversial is doing this in an embryo or in a sperm or egg uh, so that you're not only fixing the cells in a living body, you're fixing all of the cells before somebody is born so that the change you make not only will go to every cell of that new human being, but it'll go into their reproductive cells as well. So all of their children and all of their descendants will have the genetic change you made. So if you decide in the future that we want to buy better genes for our children, they can be edited uh, while they're still early stage embryos or you know, reproductive cells. You can make the edits you want, and that means it goes to every cell in their body and every one of your descendants will have the traits that you pick out using gene editing. And so, well, there's a lot of ethical implications to that. And, and bet. Jennifer Downa has spoken out quite a bit on this. So you focused on her in this biography as the sort of inspiration behind this revolution. And almost coincidentally, in 2020, she won the Nobel Prize, which was kind of proof that she was a good choice for this. But there were other players, it was like George Church. What 
is it about her that really, that reminded you say of Steve Jobs or an Albert Einstein? Like what's, what is the role of a, a technological societal revolutionary like this? You have to have passion for what you do. You're not doing it for the money. You're not doing it for anything else. You just have a passion. And in Jennifer Doudna's case and Emmanuel Charpentier, the partners that won the Nobel Prize, they had a passion for basic science. They were not looking to create a gene editing tool. They were just trying to figure out how does CRISPR work in nature? It's something that bacteria use to fight viruses. So they weren't trying to make some product. They were just trying to understand the beauty of nature. But the cool thing about the beauty of nature is that sometimes understanding a miracle or of nature allows you to then create a technology or a tool. And that's what they were able to do. As you said, James, there are many other players involved, and that's a typical entrepreneurial race. Fong Zhang, brilliant young China-born, Iowa-raised guy at the Broad Institute of MIT Harvard. He was there right with him competing to use this in human cells. So was George Church, the gentleman you mentioned, the mad scientist you mentioned, who's at Harvard University. And so my book, The Code Breaker, is not only about the passion that Jennifer Doudna brought to being a woman in science who could understand the basics of how uh, nature works, but she also had to be a really tough competitor. And, and, and the race, in the year 2012, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier figure out the exact components of CRISPR tool. And that's, you know, the big breakthrough. But then there's a huge race to say, who can make it into a tool that can edit human cells? Because they had only done it in a test tube. And so that's really five different labs around the world. And three of them, you know, cross the finish line all at the same month in January 2013. That's George Church at Harvard, Fong Zhang at MIT, and Jennifer Doudna and her, par uh, and her partners at Berkeley. And so how much of being at the forefront of these types of revolutions require both science expertise and applied expertise? So the ability to take science out of the classroom and the laboratory and really make something useful. And, you know, your, your biography of Steve Jobs is, is a, a unbelievably great example where all of this work was being done on computing, but then it was really hobbyists that were doing the microcomputer. People like, like Jobs and Wozniak and the founders of Compaq and, and, mm -hmm. uh, radio show, you know, the TRS 80 and, and, and so on. So what do you think is more important here, the science or the applied ability? Well, you know, the science has a, offers you a great vision of how nature works, but vision without execution is just hallucination. Now we admire the great scientists who understand the basic science, but never apply it. But the cool thing about Jennifer Doudna is what I call the bench to bedside phenomenon. She's able to take something from a lab bench, you know, that's a basic science discovery and turn it into something that can have clinical use, you know, a bedside tool that can be used in hospitals or for medical reasons. But even more importantly, it's a tool that raises, as you say, a lot of um, philosophical, moral questions, which is, do we want to edit our children? And so what I like about Jennifer Doudna is that not simply was she a basic scientist and not simply was she somebody who connected basic science to technology, but then she started thinking about the moral and policy implications just like, you know, maybe the people who invented social networks spent a lot of time understanding the basic technology and a lot of time applying it to products, but they haven't yet figured out the ethical, moral, and policy issues. I mean, you look at like, you know, you talked about the three revolutions in the past century, and one of them was, the first one was the atom. And you look at the number of physicists, including Einstein himself, uh, who really were torn about the use of you know, relativity and other discoveries in physics to make an atomic bomb. And we see something similar happening here. Like you, you write about Doudna's dream that Hitler would be particularly interested in CRISPR technology. And what, 
what are the dangers? And you, we briefly referred to them earlier, but what would you say are the dangers? Where, where are we going 20 years from now that's going to be almost unstoppable by, let's say, nefarious players? Yeah, they're already, uh, both the Defense Department of the United States and certainly in Russia and China, are using CRISPR to create deadly, you know, viruses. I mean, now this coronavirus probably was something natural, but certainly with CRISPR, you could create biological weapon. Uh, you could also create super soldiers, something Vladimir Putin has talked about, which is soldiers who are resistant to radiation or resistant to pain. So those are the things when Jennifer Doudna had her Hitler dream, she's worried about a person like a Hitler saying, I want to create a super race. I want to create a genetically enhanced race. Uh, but leaving aside some uh, evil country trying to do it for military purposes, you will have a natural supermarket almost, a genetic supermarket, where people can choose the genetic traits they want to have for their children. And things I worry about is that if, these, uh, if that genetic supermarket isn't free, and it won't be, uh, then the rich will be buying better genes for their kids. And so the natural inequalities we have in our society will not only be worsened, they'll be encoded in our very genes, will almost become different subspecies, like, you know, Brave New World, uh, you know, in that book, in which the rich buy better genes for their children. Another thing that could happen is we could edit the diversity out of our species. You know, most of us would say we, you know, want our kids any way they come out, we're gonna love them whatever they are. But if you could start designing your children and you were in a secret, you know, a room where nobody knew what choices you were making or, or it wouldn't judge you for what choices you were making at a fertility clinic, you know, would you check off the box that says taller? Maybe so. Or Absolutely. Would you check off the box that says blonde hair? Probably not. <laughs> you have curly hair. Would you want curly hair for your kids? Well, as a young boy, it was not pleasant. I was often made fun of, but now I'm I'm proud of my hair. So yes. All right. What about your skin color? You want to make sure they're white, right? Well, and I, it's a very interesting. I had an interview once with, um, and this was the topic was was racism, and I was talking to various African Americans, and I was talking to a politician, a well known politician who's African American, and, and I asked her. What would she pay if her to have her children be white? And she started crying on that because she realized there was an answer to that question, and she had never even thought about this before. So yeah, the our scary that question questions. takes my breath away. I mean, it's just it's amazing you asked it, and amazing that she teared up when you asked it. The issue is, twenty years from now, that might be a question everybody faces, whether it's race or height even IQ, sexual orientation, you name it. I mean, a lot of this sounds insidious, but like in the book, you also talk about the AP4OE, the AP0E4 gene, which is good, linked James. to, thank you very much, sir. Uh, it's linked to Alzheimer's, which if so, and I don't know if the, the proof is substantial on this, but if so, that would be another single gene mutation that causes a uh, one of the leading, it's, it's one of the leading causes of death, Alzheimer's. That's something that I would very much welcome, whether sure. it was passed on to my descendants or just applicable to me or however it could be done. We definitely want to stop Alzheimer's. My wife's uh, mother had Alzheimer's and I know how painful it can be. It's not exactly a single gene and that's one of the issues here is that it's not something we can do in the next year or two. It'll be 20, 30 years from now, but Still, we got to start thinking about it because a lot of these have multiple genes that have multiple purposes. And when we start fiddling with mother nature and the, you know, billions of base pairs of our DNA, we have to be careful. We don't have unintended consequences, but you're right. That single gene that you mentioned does play a role in memory. We've already already edited it in mice so that they can remember the way through the maze better mm -hmm. and it works. And so it, probably won't be more than 15 years from now when we can edit our children not only to prevent Alzheimer's, but to make sure they have better memory, uh, which we might think is a really good thing, but be careful of what you wish for. And when you start doing better memory and better focus and better processing power, 
at some point, you probably are affecting general IQ, or general intelligence. And that's something else we have to be careful of. Uh, people, a lot of people have genes that predispose them to depression. You know, you'd want those edited out. On the other hand, we don't know what that does to the species, or for that matter, to our culture, if we no longer have, you know, Vincent Van Gogh's and Ernest Hemingway's. Yeah, I, I saw you mentioned in the book that uh, Hemingway was bipolar. I did not, I did not realize that actually. So, which could I think a lot of great artists have had, um, you know, issues that uh, we would call uh, either manic depression or bipolar or schizophrenia, and it is something you really don't want to subject your child to. On the other hand, we do not understand well how it fits into what our species is. So I think whatever we're editing, we have to be cautious, but you also have to realize I went to Jennifer Dowden's lab in Berkeley. I had a graduate student with me for two days and I was edit, able to use CRISPR to edit genes. I even edited human genes. Now we flushed them down the drain with chlorine so that they, you know, they didn't survive. But this is going to be something that people will be able to do uh, just like the Chinese scientist, scientist Ho Zhuang Qi, who edited the CRISPR uh, babies so they wouldn't be susceptible to HIV uh, reception. It's something that a lot of people are going to be able to do 10 years from now. So it's going to be hard to write rules that regulate it. You mentioned one guy in the book who's been building like a, a home testing kit for gene editing, uh, Hosea yeah. Zimer. I, yeah. I, I think I said his first name correct. And uh, what has he been able to do just from his garage? Well, uh, he's uh, sort of like Puck in uh, Midsummer Night's Dream in my book. He keeps popping up to show what fools we mortals be. Uh, and he pokes fun at all the pretensions of all these people going to ethics conferences. I was just uh, uh, talk, uh, emailing him a few days ago, and he went in front of a whole group of people and took a CRISPR-Cas9 editing uh, of edited genes that knock out one of the genes that restricts the growth of your muscles. I mean, at a certain point, you have your muscles, and then your body says, don't keep growing muscles. And so he wanted to have super muscles, and he injected himself with you know, CRISPR-edited cells in order to do that. It didn't really work. It was a, you know, it was a little too simple of an experiment. But people are uh, raising cattle or already using that to make double-muscle cattle, which, of course, are more valuable. So eventually, 10 years from now, we'll be able to make very muscular children and bigger children if we decide we want to. So that's a, you know, that's the type of issue I think we're going to have to face. And Josiah Zayner, the uh, biohacker, you know, you mentioned, uh, he even sent me some biohack uh, DNA vaccine that he had made that I could inject myself uh, and it would protect me from the coronavirus. Now, I'm not as brave as he is. I entered the Pfizer company uh, clinical trial uh, so I could do my own citizen science in a safer way. But I think you're going to have biohackers take matters into their own hands at some point. And that's a fascinating uh, section of my book. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable, 
pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts are untucked shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, Shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take 
one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov. You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. The exponential nature of innovation in these industries, like computers, we know there's Moore's law every 18 months, computing power doubles. And I'm not quite sure what the Moore's law equivalent is, but it used to cost a hundred thousand dollars to see, or at least to cost a $10 million to sequence the human genome. Now you can do it. You could send your, you know, spit or whatever to 23 and me. And for a hundred dollars, you can sequence your genome. And so, whether the, to Josiah's point, making fun of the ethics of this, it might be a moot point because if it costs a dollar to sequence a genome and 50 cents to edit it, which it will eventually, and if we also understand multiple gene mutations better, it, it doesn't even matter what the laws are, people are going to do it. Well, that's one of the concerns. Uh, I don't think it will grow as fast as Moore's law allowed computing power to grow because our body cells are not quite the same as microchips and uh, it's a lot more complicated. However, you're right. It now costs a million dollars, say, to treat a patient with sickle cell through a bone marrow editing. Soon that'll be down to $5,000. We'll be able to do things like that. And certainly editing embryos will be very cheap. I mean, the Chinese scientists did it in some, you know, a small fertility clinic and, you know, a very little known clinic in China. So yes. And at that point, we have to figure out, should we have rules? And as you put it, can we have rules? Can you stop rogues from doing it? Even if you have rules in the United States, is somebody going to set up shop in, you know, in uh, in the Bahamas or in uh, you know a Caribbean island, or and offer genetic tourism for people to come and have their genes edited, you know, at some offshore facility? I think that there are ways to control these things. We do control a lot of medical technologies. The FDA is very good at doing it. And yes, people will probably be able to find some underground method of doing it with a biohacker or fly to some place where it's not regulated. But I think we can regulate 90, 95% of this. So the question becomes, what do we want to regulate? Do we want to make it against the law to be able to buy higher IQ points for your children? And you tell me, should that be against the law? Uh, I don't think so. And again, in part, it's because regardless of my own personal views of the ethics, I do think if we regulate it, there will be, as you refer to it, genetic tourism at some point, the easier and easier it gets. And so we could be hurting America if this is, let's say, the only country that can't do it. Now, the ethics of it, I could be totally against that, but I'm also, you know, it's, it's sort of like saying, should I tell someone the, the, the ending of a movie <laughs> information is power. So the more information you have, maybe the better uh, knowledge you have. And, and if everybody else is doing something that we can't do or know something that we don't know, maybe that puts us in trouble as, as a country. Yeah. I think I spent uh, time in the book. There's so many wonderful arguments and great people dealing with it. And I think as you read through the book, you'll see both the benefits especially in an era of pandemic, 
you know, the benefits of editing our genes, perhaps, to be less susceptible to viruses. But also you'll see the ways we could try to stop uh, this notion of people buying better genes for their kids in a way that divides our society or ends up uh, reducing the diversity of the human species. So I think it's a very interesting, fun, intellectual and moral uh, yes. a discussion to have. And there's so many colorful people in my book, George Church, you mentioned, trying to bring back the mastodon, you know, through genetic editing of elephant. But George Church says, why should I care? I think it's a good thing if people can buy more IQ points or more inches on the height of their children. And so I have other people explaining why this could be actually a big problem for society. But it's a type of thing we all have to start wrestle or that it's interesting to wrestle through it now because it's the, you know, it's always interesting to understand how something works, especially when that something is ourselves. So we're gonna have to wrestle this uh, through for the next 10, 15 years because after that, the technologies will be there. Yeah, the one thing that probably helps us a little bit is that, again, right now we're, we're aware because of the sequencing of the human genome of all diseases related to single gene mutations. Mm -hmm. And it's not a simple problem. Like, like take IQ, for instance, that mm -hmm. might involve hundreds of gene mutations. And it, it's an infinite, like it's not, you can't just throw computing power at it because it might require all the computing in the universe to, to solve this problem. So at least on some of these complicated issues, we are hampered by um, almost mathematical limitations of, of computing. In terms of the issue of, will the rich be able to buy mutations and the poor won't be, I'm not as worried about that because again of the, the speed of which the technology will increase. Eventually people of any income level will be able to to do it, it seems, I don't know. We'll find out and we can try to make it that way. I yeah. mean, Jennifer Doudna, one of the things she's doing to address the question we just talked about is right now, if you're very wealthy or if you're part of an experiment, you can have Tay-Sachs or sickle cell or other things like that fixed. How do we make it so that we drive the cost down so you can make a true impact on things like sickle cell anemia? Yeah. and so. What what triggered you? I mean, you've done these amazing biographies, and I encourage everyone to read them. You're you're the biographer of our times, and st between Steve Jobs, Da Vinci, Einstein, Benjamin Franklin, such amazing books. What triggered you to what what When did you wake up one day and say, "You know what, Jennifer Dowd is next. I'm going to write a biographer biography of her." And then, what are the challenges of a good biographer? What what did you What did you do to make this biography special? Yeah, I met uh, Jennifer Doudna about eight, 10 years ago when I interviewed her and was with her somewhere. And I realized that I've always been interested in how life works. I've never been a great scientist, but when I was a kid, I, I kind of liked understanding how our body works. And then when coronavirus comes along, we're all trying to figure out, all right, what's an antibody? What is a virus? You know, how do you fight a virus? Those type of things. So I realized we're going into a new era in which biotech, you know, where molecules will be the next microchip. Uh, kids, instead of having them simply learn how to do digital coding, they're going to have to learn to genetic coding as well. And so I figured having written about Steve Jobs, who was a grand symbol of the digital revolution, and having written about Einstein, who is a grand symbol of the physics revolution, I should do the next great revolution that all of us and our kids are going to have to understand, and that's the biotech revolution. And when I decided to write about her, she was very cooperative. But when you do a biography, you have to realize you want to tell a story. The first six words I put into my head when I write a biography is, let me tell you a story. And I usually begin with a story like Jennifer Doudna having to pick up her kid uh, because of the COVID pandemic, or when she was young, picking up James Watson's The Double Helix and realizing by reading about Rosalind Franklin in that book that women can become scientists. So I always try to make my books narrative storytelling 
rather than reading like a history book or a textbook. And that just means you tell a story in a narrative way, just as you would over dinner with close friends. So, so two questions about, about the process, uh, really three. One is, you know, there's a, a well-known concept called the arc of the hero, where you have a hero who's reluctant at first, but then is, there's a call to action. They have exceedingly greater problems and exceedingly more powerful enemies, but friends to help along the way. Do you envision that structure when you're doing a biography? Yeah, that's sort of the hero structure of a book. But to me, it's more. There are a couple of other things. First is every biography is a journey of discovery. So it's a little bit like the Odyssey, as well as you know the uh, hero books you're talking about. And the journey of discovery involves both the main character, but also me, the writer, and the reader going on a journey in which you realize these amazing things and you discover it. And to me, those are the best types of novels. It can be Huckleberry Finn, it can be The Odyssey, it can be an old TV show like Route 66. But, uh, you know, one of the tropes about writing is that there are only a certain number of themes and one of them is a person goes on a journey. So that's what I look for first and foremost. But when you go on a journey, whether you're Ulysses or Odyssey or Steve Jobs or Jennifer Doudna, you run into people you cooperate with and you run into people you're rivals of. And in a more complicated way, you run into people who are both. Like a Steve Jobs runs into a Bill Gates or a Jennifer Doudna has to fight off the men at MIT and Harvard who are racing her to make this technology. So it's partly a journey of discovery, then it becomes a heroic quest, and then it becomes a competition, but a competition that ends up with elements of cooperation. And the cool thing about this book is it begins when she decides she has to turn her attention to fighting coronavirus. And all of the rivals that fought and competed with her to get gene editing technology, such as the people at MIT, Harvard, they all band together and share intellectual property in the fight against coronavirus. So it's a book with a narrative arc in which you also say the competition recedes when we realize it's about something larger than just ourselves. I think that type of scene occurs in many of your biographies. Like I was really touched in the Steve Jobs biography when towards the end, Steve Jobs is sick and he's in his, in his house, suddenly, the back door opens and Bill Gates wanders in and just hangs out with Steve Jobs for, for an hour or so. And I thought that was a beautiful scene, which shows that the intensity of their relationship, whether positive or negative through the years, it's the intensity itself that is, that is almost celebrated by them at the end. You know, you see it in Shakespeare, you see it in Homer, you see it in novels like the masters or whatever, which is two people who are rivals and compete also understand each other better than all the people who aren't in the arena with them. And so they forge a particular bond. And then when they find a common foe, such as the coronavirus, that bond becomes particularly meaningful. I'm glad you pointed out, James, that part of the Steve Jobs book, because in the end, the complexity of that relationship with Bill Gates, they're both born the same year, you know, they are rivals, but they also have to cooperate. Uh, uh, when they come together at the end, that to me is, as you say, an arc of a narrative that's particularly interesting. And you see that at the end of this book I've just written, where Jennifer Doudna has close partners, mainly the women she worked with on RNA, such as Emmanuel Charpentier, who won the Nobel Prize with her, and great rivals. Uh, but in the end, we have almost like an alien invader, which is this coronavirus, until people start sharing the basic science that'll help us defeat it. Now, with, with Steve Jobs, was that hard to get him to agree to write about him? I, I don't think there's any biography as intimate as yours about him. Yeah, he ended up, we had a very close and you know, intimate relationship. You know, I'd just sit on his bedside when he was sick and he would, I'd read him parts of the book. He would tell me the stories. 
he was somebody with intense emotional connections, a very spiritual person, but he also shut people out at times. And off and on, you know, he would be working with me and then he'd shut me out for a while. But at the end, I, I think, I, I can't quite fully explain it, but he shut a lot of people out. I wish he hadn't have shut out, but he allowed me to get very close and told me just a whole lot of things, some of which were personal and would have been hurtful to people and that wouldn't help the reader of the book. So they're not in the book because I think partly he was, you know, in pain and, uh, you know, was very ill. But that intimacy I tried to convey so you could understand how his mind worked. I sometimes write about people who are, you know, like Leonardo da Vinci or Ben Franklin or Einstein, who I don't get to know, who've been dead before I was around. Uh, and that's harder to do. And that's why I enjoyed working with Jennifer Doudna, because she let me just be with her at her lab. She let me be with her in her Slack channels and her Zoom meetings. She let me be with her as she did her science, but also did her meetings and conferences and just to be with her at her home. So I hope you get just as intimate of a portrayal of a scientist. It says, what does a scientist do every day and how beautiful is it? I hope that intimacy with her comes through in the book, just like the Steve Jobs one did. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And there's also in, uh, there's like, and I'm just going to riff on this. I feel like there's three types of biographies. There's one where it's like one dimensional. You talk to the person you're writing the biography of, and you only get that person's answers and whatever they provide you. And then you write your biography. So it's very one-sided. And then there's the biography where you just referred to situations where sometimes details could be hurtful and won't really help move forward the story, so you leave them out. They're, they're, they're the sort of gossipy biographies um, that, that we see so often about celebrities and so on. And then the third is yours, where, and this, I'm curious about this with both Jennifer and Steve Jobs, you have to kind of also find out things they're not telling you, and maybe they wouldn't even be happy if these were in the biography, but they're important to the story. And like, what what's- That was a cool thing that Jennifer Doudna did this time and Steve Jobs did last time, which is, Talk to, talk to everybody, talk to my rivals. I mean, Jennifer said, go talk to Fong Zhang at MIT, Eric Lander and others at Harvard. Uh, I flew over to Berlin to spend time with Emmanuel Charpentier, who you know shared the Nobel Prize with her. Um, so there's probably a hundred people I talked to in order to do the book. And I think you need to do that in order to have a full picture of a person you know, because you want to make them human. You don't want to cut them down to size with just, uh, you know, cheap shots. But you want to show that they have strengths as well as weaknesses. And Steve Jobs, you know, as you know from that book, a lot of his rough edges are in that book. And the fact that he was a jerk at times, it's in that book. But when I told him about it, when we talked about it, he said, put it all in. I want it to be the true story. And that's what Jennifer did too. She said, just put it in, talk to everybody. You know, I want this to be a human drama, not a one dimensional drama. You, you, um, you mentioned that Jennifer in the book, you mentioned that Jennifer is not very driven by money. And I find that in many, many of the, your subjects, they are not driven by money. Steve jobs while on the surface was obviously a billionaire and, and you can't say you, you can never say directly he was driven by money. He almost went broke. As you point out, he almost went broke developing Pixar and then next computer and so on. He was really driven by his, his curiosity. Do you think not being driven by money is a, a key quality of many of the people you're uh, profiling? Yes. It's a great question, James. And the answer is yes. As Steve Jobs said to me, there's some people who are motivated by making a company with profits and those who are motivated by making a great product. And said, if, you want, if you're aiming just at making profits, you're going to cut corners. You're going to do things you think people won't notice or won't see that'll save you a little bit of money or make you a little bit more of a margin. He said, but that way is a disaster. He said, if you focus just on making insanely great products, the profits are going to follow. But if you focus on making just profits, the product is going to suffer and soon, you know, it's all going to be for naught. 
And certainly with Jennifer Doudna, she was focused like a laser on understanding the miraculous beauty of the way nature works. She loved looking at the sleeping grass when she was six years old and growing up in Hawaii, you know, where you'd touch the grass and it would curl up and snap shut. And, you know, you and I have seen things like that, you know, fun things in nature, but we probably don't obsess over how does that happen? What happens inside? What are the cells doing that makes the grass react that way? And so she cared about the beauty of the basic science, not about uh, making a tool that would make her money. And if you care about the basic science, the technology ends up following. But if you're only caring about making something in order to make a buck, you probably aren't going to spend time understanding the depth and beauty of the basic science. I agree. If you're focused on making money, you probably won't make the kind of money these people make because they keep going even after they made the money yeah. and, and developing new products and so on. Another aspect that seems to be a commonality between these many people you profile is charisma. Einstein obviously had a very unique kind of charisma in order to get very obscure ideas. No, people don't really understand what the theory of relativity is, but they think they do. And Einstein with the hair and his quirks and, and so on, uh, you point out many of them, is, is very charismatic, as is Steve Jobs, as is Jennifer Doudna, as is Benjamin Franklin. What's, what's the role of charisma and, and what's special about these people's charisma? You know, I asked myself when I was writing about Einstein, what if he didn't have that wild halo of hair and that piercing eyes and that, you know, very recognizable face? Would we still treat him as the greatest genius almost of all time? Or if he had looked like Niels Bohr, you know, would he just have been in the category of Niels Bohr, just a regular ordinary genius? I think in Einstein's case, he was truly a great genius, but he did know that projecting an aura, having that wild halo of hair, that kind of added to who he was. Steve Jobs did the same thing with the same black turtleneck every day and the way he would present himself. I think Jennifer Dowden is a little bit different. She does not seek celebrity at all. In fact, they want to make a movie of this book. I think they're going to do it. But it was hard to convince Jennifer to want it to happen because she's not a publicity seeker. So, and I, I want to be respectful of your time. You've been very generous with it and answered lots of questions. Who's somebody that you've considered profiling because they fit many of your characteristics of kind of a, a revolutionary of society and innovation and so on, but you ultimately decided not to pro write a bi biography of them. Uh, Louis Armstrong. I spent a couple of years. I'm here in New Orleans now. My hometown grew up right near where Louis Armstrong grew up in the central city of New Orleans. And I wanted to write a book about him because he was a total genius and created, invented almost out of whole cloth, the substance around uh, the only unique American music of its time, jazz. And after a while, I listened to all of the tapes he left and all the writings he did and interviewed people who knew him. And I found I knew everything there was to know about Louis Armstrong except for who he was. I didn't really know if he was happy. I didn't know why he was smiling. I didn't you know, know if he liked white people. I just couldn't crack the code on Louis Armstrong. So I put the book aside. Um, and sometimes you have to do that. Uh, when I was working with Jennifer Doudna at a certain point, after about a year, I said, boom, I've got it. This one is going to work because I understood what was driving her. And also it was, became my passion. I became, believe it or not, passionate about knowing how our cells work and not in a high school biology way, but in a, oh my God, this is beautiful way. And so just like we love certain mysteries, to me, it became a detective story, a mystery story, a story about discovery. And that's when I knew this book I was destined to write. What other biographies can you recommend that um, kind of inspired you as a biographer? Like what? Yeah. I personally love biographies. So I'm just curious what your, your favorites are. Well, in the, in the case of this book, reading James Watson's The Double Helix was very important. And um, a more obscure book, Horace uh, Freeland Judson's 
The Eighth Day of Creation is just a beautiful, beautiful book. In terms of biography, I've always been inspired by David McCullough. Mm-hmm. Um, from early on when he did, uh, well, he, you know, the Jonestown Flood, but basically the Truman biography that he did, because I realized he understood people and actually cared for them. And he cared about the subjects he was writing about. He wasn't just doing it, you know, as a, uh, as a pursuit. He was doing it because he cared about the settling of Missouri and about plain people being in government. And he, uh, so he became a mentor of mine. And he also was somebody who wrote in a narrative style, which I admired, meaning he wasn't trying to make it overly academic. He would do that thing I mentioned at the beginning, which is, let me tell you a story. And it would flow in a narrative way. So I guess he's my mentor and hero in the art of biography writing, along with Doris Kearns Goodwin, who is, believe it or not, my college uh, history professor. So oh, that's funny. Before she published any books, and she was actually just a early, untenured junior professor. But she also is a tremendous storyteller. So one one final thing, you know, I forgot to mention you were the CEO of CNN um, yeah. in the early OOS, two thousand one, two three, around that time. I I, I think mm-hmm. I got the right years right. Given the evolution of news now as being very polarized and opinion oriented, like I can't imagine the sort of headlines we see now existing during your time. It was a lot more kind of just fact based and information based as opposed to opinion based. What's what's the direction of where's news going to end up versus uh, mass media news generated by social media? Well, I'm going to embarrass you a little, James, by letting your listeners know you're older than uh, they may think. And when you were very, very young, you and I worked together at the beginning of new media. At you were at HBO, and I was at Time Magazine, but it was all owned by Time Warner. And what happened was we were able to create things like Pathfinder and Roadrunner, which were digital outlets that allowed everybody to, instead of reading Time Magazine or Newsweek or watching. NBC Nightly News, everybody could have different sources of information. And so soon information became very balkanized. If you had a particular interest or a particular political bent, you were able to find your own niche of news uh, that catered to your uh, desires and thoughts and preferences. And that in some ways disunified us as a nation. I think that disunity has now been exacerbated really badly by the big social media companies. The algorithms of Facebook and Twitter are almost designed to enrage us and make us more excited. And if you, you know, if you like listening to Laura Ingram, you should also like Mark, you know, Levin or whatever, and brings you down a rabbit hole of reinforcing your opinions. I think we have to get out of that. So I think the future of media is people who are going to reinvent social networks to do what social networks would be more valuable at doing, which is connect us rather than divide us. I've joined Clubhouse. I find that's a very connecting medium. Podcasts are a very connecting medium. You do not succeed with a podcast simply by getting people infuriated and making them feel divisive. You succeed by almost as if you're built a campfire and people are sitting around the campfire listening. So I think podcasts, new forms of social media that are unifying rather than divisive will be the next wave of media. And hopefully it'll help us get out of this political divisiveness we're in. Well, Walter Isaacson, author of the just released book, The Code Breaker, Jennifer Doudna, Gene Editing and the Future of the Human Race, Also author of many other biographies, uh, including Steve Jobs, Einstein, we talked about all of them. Uh, Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This has really been uh, a dream of mine to have you on the podcast. I'm glad you're here. And uh, thanks once again. Thank you, James. Appreciate it, my man.
At FedEx Office, we're here with the holiday cheer and expertise to help get your small businesses to do list done. Let us help you slay the holidays with the products, services, tools, and timelines that will make your business bright. Create more happy for the holidays at office.fedex.com.